Hi guys, this is Tensor from the Tensor Programming Blog. So I thought I'd do a quick video about the uh, release of Elm 1.8 because I got a few questions on both YouTube and on Twitter regarding this specific release. There are not any really large changes to the syntax or to the front end of Elm, but there are some really cool back end changes that I'd like to at least show you. So as you can see here, on the left side, we have our new version. So this is our the snake game that we wrote in one of the tutorials. And on the right is the actual 0.17 version. So this is the one that we actually wrote in the video. There are some slight changes here. One of the biggest ones, in my opinion, is the fact that the HTML app import, this thing here, has been rolled inside of HTML. So as you can see, I do not have to explicitly state import HTML as app anymore. I just import HTML, and right here we have HTML.program, and we can write our main function right here. And I think that that's just a logical move on the part of the developers, considering that um, everybody basically uses this style of programming in Elm. Another minor thing that was changed in the syntax is the reappropriation of single quotes. So if you notice in some of our variable names, we used single quotes. So for example here, we have a head variable and then we have a head prime variable. And this was to differentiate the two variables from one another, but still have the same name. In our new file, we use underscores instead. So as you can see here, head underscore and tail underscore, head tail underscore even direction underscore down here. That's a minor difference. They did this mainly because it was a little confusing. It does make sense to reappropriate it to mostly just strings and characters. Now here I've opened up a REPL. Here's another big change. So for example, in my, I believe it was the second ELM tutorial, I showed that we could create lists by double dotting. So for example, one double dot 10 would create a list from one to 10. This doesn't work anymore. And the reason they did this is because apparently not many people were using this type of shorthand. Personally, I like it a lot, or I liked it a lot, but I can see why they removed it. Now you would just type in list.range, I'm 1 and 10, and it would do exactly what we were doing before. If you wanted to do some of the uh, things that we were doing with lists, for example, adding them together. So you could use parentheses to concatenate lists you know, this would be a similar thing to doing like something like this in the old version of Elm. It's just a minor change. It's really not a big deal once you are used to the functional style of Elm. The biggest change is the way that uh, Elm actually handles its error messages. So as you can see, we have a nice error message here and Elm's always had a very, very nice readable error messages. They've, um, made things a little bit easier. So like for example, if we were to call a recursive call like this, it would specifically tell you, okay, X is defined directly in terms of itself, causing an infinite loop. Another error here is for missing arguments. So for example, if we import string and we say foo equals foo plus string dot json let's just say join boo this will give us a more detailed reason why this is not working so it'll say here it looks like this function needs one more argument probably the coolest feature though is the new implementation of the time travel debugger so Alma's had a time traveling debugger for a very long time and what a time traveling debugger is, is it allows you to go back and forth through the state of a, of a program uh, at will. So as you can see here, I've actually created an HTML file out of this. And I'll show you how I did that. So if we want to make our file, so we type in elm make, and we want to make main.elm. If we type in the debug flag here, so it compiled our module to HTML. Now if we open this in Firefox, as you can see, it's our snake game. But notice down on the right here, we have this little box now called Explore History. Now this is obviously not something I programmed into our snake game. But uh, here, let me uh, 
get this to eat a few apples. Then I'll show you what's going on. So okay, so let's pause it now. And if we look, we actually have a little thing here that shows us the history. So we have all these ticks that are going on. And this is because we have ticks happening every second in our game. And as you can see, we can actually go back in time through our state. So every single time our snake moved, every single time our snake we pressed a key, it's being logged. And as you can see here, this JSON structure is being manipulated as a result. Now this structure, of course, is based off of our model. So if we go back into our code, you can see here, here's our type alias of game. And if we look at what we have here, we have a variable called 8fruit. We have a field called 8fruit, which is a boolean. We have our dimensions, which is our window size. So as you can see here, this is our window. Direction, which is a direction type. Let's see. It's either left, right, up, or down. And as you can see, currently it's up. Our fruit is a block. So it shows here the coordinates of the fruit where it's spawned and everything. Then we have an is dead field. So because the snake is, the game's not finished, the snake's alive, it's false. Uh, because the game isn't paused at this current moment in time, it's also false here for paused. And then we also have a list for our snake, and this shows each of the individual blocks, where they currently are, and everything. We can actually, as you can see, we can actually expose everything about them. We can hide some of this stuff if we want to as well. So this is really cool, and I mean, like, you can see here, I can literally go all the way back to the beginning of the game and start, you know, everything over and walk through everything if I want to. I can even export this to a text file or import state if I want to. Say I have a saved text file and I change the program a bit, I can import the state from an older text file and then run it again and see if I run into the same errors and stuff. So this is really friggin cool. And what's even cooler about this is that this time travel debugger actually will work for your code even if it is embedded in uh, JavaScript or HTML. So the reason why it's important for the debugger to work when Elm is embedded in both JavaScript or HTML is because many people use Elm in production in larger projects that typically use both HTML and JavaScript. This means that even though the actual JavaScript wrappers that are being used with the Elm API cannot go back in time, the Elm itself can be rewound and the JavaScript and database are not going to have some kind of side effect as it happens. Just so that you guys know, uh, while we are making our files here, you can still use the Elm reactor and the actual debugger is on by default. So let me show you a quick example of that. So if we just run Elm reactor, which is our server, as you can see, it's listening on localhost 8000. If we come in there into Elm reactor and we just go to main.elm, it'll build our project. And then as you can see here, we have the explore history box right here. So you don't have to build the project, but I, I do think it is cool that when you build the project, this little explore history piece of code gets built into your project. It is a very useful um, tool, even for beginners, because especially for beginners, because it can be fairly difficult to visualize how a program actually changes over time, and now you can physically see it. Sorry guys, I'm kind of getting wrapped up in playing Snake. So anyway, as you can see here, I mean, we can go through every single little step here and check out when the snake died. So here, the game ended after this tick here. So yeah, it's it's pretty, pretty uh, nifty tool. Any of you guys just fooling around with Elm, make sure to use this to make use of this tool certainly one of the coolest things to come out recently. Let's look at one other quick example. As you can see here, I have our to-do program. I, I just 
this was refractored also for uh, 0.18 and um, I've generated our HTML file let's just open that up real quick and here we go and if we type in a few to do so and say we delete all of them now let's open our history and as you can see it has all of the different things happening we can go through and uh, even re-add the to-dos and stuff like that and this is our model and our model only has two fields in this program as well as you can see to-dos which is just a string and then to-dos which is a list of strings so yeah this is pretty cool anyway guys I hope this cleared up any questions you might have about the new version of Elm if you guys are still having trouble adapting some of the tutorials to the new version of Elm I will leave a link in the description of how you can update a existing project to 0.18 from 0.17 there is a uh, official github for that also uh, the reason why there haven't been any go tutorial uh, videos up until now is mainly because I've been sick for the past week we should have a few out in the next few days alright guys well I hope you enjoyed this video if you like it please feel free to subscribe and like if you have any questions of course feel free to comment and if you disliked it feel free to dislike it as much as you want and have a good night